So thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. I'm uh, Jonathan Newman. No relation to Patrick Newman, as we've already covered. Um, I want to start off with a short story. I uh, was perusing the New York Fed blog. So the people at the New York Fed, they run this blog, and they write about different topics. And this was a few years ago, and I found a, an, a blog about the Panic of 1819, which I was sort of interested in. So I read through it. And I'm also a professor of economics, and so I read papers that my students write. And one of the jobs that I have when I'm reading papers is, you know, you got to check for plagiarism. You got to, you know, make sure that the students aren't copying somebody else's work. Unfortunately, while I was reading this blog from the New York Fed, there were some there were some bits in there, and here's here's what here's what I found. There were some bits in their blog that sounded exactly like Rothbard's book, The Panic of 1819, like the, word for word, actually. So I actually did. I feel like I I did catch them plagiarizing Rothbard. And the way that I know that I actually did catch them is because they admitted to it afterwards. So after, I guess they saw there was a bunch of web traffic going to their article from Mises.org, and they're like, what in the world? Why is everybody going to this old article about the Panic of 1819? And you'll notice that they added this author's update. Murray Rothbard's The Panic of 1819, Reactions and Policies, was an additional source for this past uh, for this post and should have been cited. We regret this omission. <laughs> To which I was thinking, man, I hope you regret it, yeah. <laughs> and so the reason I, I start off with this is because I want to cite my sources here at the beginning. Major uh, source for this talk is what I learned from Roger Garrison, both at Auburn University and also in his lectures here. Uh, and not just the content, but also his style. I've got some, uh, hopefully I've got some amusing, moving parts in the PowerPoints. Uh, uh, Rothbard was... Uh, or excuse me, uh, Garrison was very uh, famous for his the moving parts of his of his uh, powerpoints. So here we have Mises and Rothbard. They're fighting against uh, Friedman and, and Keynes. So here we go. They're they're about to throw the first punches. Oh, first a little bit about um, the title. So I was very intentional with the title. It's a long title: Austrian Economics versus Keynesian and Monetarist Macroeconomics. And there's just three points that I want to make about the title. The first is that Austrian economics is not divided into micro and macro. So hopefully you've seen over the course of the week that we progressed from talking about human action and what are, what are some of the things that we can say about human action that are necessarily logically true? What can we derive? What are the implications of the fact that we make choices? So which is a sort of a micro focus. We look at one individual making a choice and we tease out what sort of things apply to all humans making any sort of choice. And then we develop into a theory of prices, a theory of money, a theory of interest. And so we can talk about how credit markets work. And it turns out that this sort of like smoothly flows into talking about economy-wide phenomena like inflation and business cycles and economic growth. So there's not, there's not Austrian microeconomics and Austrian macroeconomics. It's one edifice. It's one body of economics and it's all interrelated. There's no, if you, if you found out something that works in the, or that you see in the macro economy, it doesn't really accord with what uh, Austrian micro might say then that means there's some sort of disconnect. There's something wrong. So the, it, it doesn't. It seems like the, the macro economy shouldn't be thought of as anything more than just the sum of all the individuals' preferences and their exchanges and what's going on. So, so why would we expect any uh, to use a different set of tools to talk about macroeconomic uh, phenomena as opposed to what happens at the micro level? Okay, so for Austrian economics, all cause and effect happens at the micro level. However, it does not mean that we can't talk about economy-wide phenomena. We can. So we have this integrated, fully integrated uh, body of, of economic theory. Mainstream economics, however, is divided. There are microeconomists, and they're actually subdivided into further fields. There's like labor, there's health, there's energy, all of these different subdivisions of microeconomists uh, in, in the mainstream. And they all do their own little things in their own little fields. And then there's this other group this other umbrella of macroeconomists. And just from personal experience talking with people who, who work in both of those fields, they, they don't understand each other. Like I, I've been in, in seminars where it, it was a macro uh, topic that was being presented, and the microeconomists that were sitting there, they told me afterwards, I, this doesn't make any sense to me. So it's, it's not just that you know, they're, 
They're doing different things. They're focusing on different things. They literally don't even understand each other, which is good evidence to show that it's it's almost like two totally different sciences, two totally different fields. But this definitely doesn't apply to the um, uh, to the Austrian school. So this is why I called it Austrian economics versus Keynesian and monetarist macroeconomics. So there's this this entire body of thought that we're putting up against just the macro theories from the monetarists and the Keynesians. Uh, finally, notice that it's Austrians versus the, the Keynesians and the monetarists. So they're grouped together, and they were on the right side of the screen in the Street Fighter example. So they're together, and uh, I hope that we'll have time to show that the monetarists and Keynesians are actually very similar. They have very, very similar ways of approaching uh, answering um, macroeconomic questions, and actually um, their policy prescriptions can line up um, as well. Okay. Um, there's some fraying at the top. So it, even mainstream macroeconomists understand that there's, there are some serious issues with macroeconomics as it's performed today. And I have a few quotes to, to show you this. So Noah Smith is saying, uh, was commenting on how nobody in the academic, uh, yeah, academic macroeconomics was, was able to predict the, the, uh, the most recent financial crisis. Uh, we have a quote from Paul Romer. This is a gr from a great paper um, about mathiness, where he says, presenting a model is like doing a card trick. Everybody knows that there will be some sleight of hand. There's no intent to deceive because no one takes it seriously. So this is a pretty serious indictment against how macroeconomics is done. Um, uh, Larry Summers says, real business cycle models have nothing to do with the business cycle phenomena observed in the, in the United States. Uh, Robert Solo, who, who developed a, a very... Uh, important growth model in mainstream macro, uh, has a serious critique of the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Mankiw, who uh, wrote a very important Principles of Economics a textbook, uh, said that the work of the past several decades in macro macroeconomics looks like an unfortunate wrong turn. And finally, one of the presidents of the, uh, the Federal Reserve District Banks says that uh, macroeconomics has very little to offer by way of answers to the questions of why does an economy have business cycles and why do asset prices move around so much? So this is a pretty serious indictment. And what I'd like to offer today is that Austrian economics fills this gap. It, it doesn't have these sorts of errors, and so we'll see why. Okay, so a brief review of what Austrian economics has to say about uh, macro questions, macroeconomic phenomena. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, David Howden, at the beginning of his talk, he, he showed how... Uh, I think he, he got this from Hayek. We, we need to understand how things can go right before we can analyze how things go wrong. And so the way things can go right for a macro economy is if we lower our rate of time preference, if we decide that we're going to decrease how much we want to consume today, which means that we free up resources that can be used for investment so that we can produce more, then what that does is there's a, a total restructuring, a total reallocation of, of how resources are used in the economy, away from consumption and towards production, which means that we're allowing for more production of the goods that we would like to consume in the future. So this is the path to economic growth. This is the, this is the Austrian answer. How do, you, how do you grow an economy? You save, you invest, you produce more. And when that happens, entrepreneurs will change the way that they pr they're producing things in accordance with the societal rate of time preference. So hopefully that's just a brief review of what you've already learned so far this week. How things can go wrong start with manipulation in uh, credit markets. So specifically through the, the banking system, if we have a, an increase in the supply of money, this artificially lowers the interest rate and distorts the way uh, production is done. So new money enters circulation through credit markets, which is a special case of Cantillon effects. And it lowers the interest rate. Entrepreneurs bid for factors of production and begin to implement new longer lines of production just as if there were increased savings. Incomes increase, which lead consumers to consume more and bid at the prices of consumer goods. Real investment, however, has not increased. So the entrepreneurs will find an increasing scarcity of the capital goods required to complete their projects, which leads to an increase in the cost of production beyond what they anticipated, and so they abandon those projects. So this is, th this is th just a very short description of the Austrian boom-bust cycle, and, and it has a very specific, very certain uh, beginning. So we know exactly what causes it, and we, we can trace through the pattern of what will happen uh, uh, when we see this manipulation in credit markets. Okay, so now let's do an overview of Keynesian 
uh, macroeconomics. And we'll talk about the, I'll do Austrians versus Keynesians, and then I'll do Austrians versus monetarists. And then at the end, I have a slide about how the monetarists and Keynesians are the same. So Keynesian macro is based on the circular flow model. So the, this is sort of the, the base, this is the foundation of Keynesian macroeconomics, whereas the base or foundation for Austrian macroeconomics are talking about economy-wide uh, things would be looking at the structure of production. So Keynes decided to look at the economy as if it's a, a circular flow. We have the households and individuals who own the factors of production, own the firms, and also consume the output from the firms. They're on the right-hand side. And they purchase goods and services from the firms in this top market. There's the market for goods and services at the top. And then firms produce that output by using the factors of production that they get from the households um, and individuals in the bottom market. So they purchase those factors of production in, in, the, in the bottom part. And so we have a, a flow of money that emerges in the economy. So households and individuals are spending. That spending is revenue for the firms. And then the firms take that revenue and they pay it out as income to the factor owners. So the, the people who own the labor own the capital. And anything that's different, they, it goes to entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs are, or entrepreneurship is viewed as a factor of production in this model, which is very different from the way Austrians would, would treat entrepreneurship. So this is taken as an equilibrium condition. If we have income, which is capital Y in this model, if it's equal to the level of expenditures, which is capital E, then Keynes said we have an equilibrium. This, this economy is stable. The spending on the top half is the same as the spending on the bottom half. The flow is, is even. And so if we can set these two magnitudes, these two spending flows equal to each other, we get income equals expenditure. And this is the equilibrium condition in the Keynesian model. Expenditures are disaggregated a bit into consumption spending, investment spending, and government spending, and also net exports. But just for our purposes today, I'm just going to assume a closed economy. So consumption spending is C, investment spending is I, and government spending is G. The first graphical model of using this equation was called the Keynesian cross or the income and expenditure model. So you take those three components of expenditure and you stack them on top of each other. And that gives you the total level of expenditure in the economy. So you have consumption spending and then you add investment spending and then you add government spending. And that gives you the total level of expenditure. Notice that there's this diagonal line coming out of the origin. That's the equilibrium condition line. That's the line where all levels of of income equal the levels of expenditure. And so if we have, if our economy is, is on that line, it means that we're in macroeconomic, macroeconomic equilibrium from the Keynesian perspective. Okay, so you'll notice that only one of the, um, one of the components of the expenditure has a slope, and that's the consumption function there at the bottom. The consumption function is the only one that has a slope, and it's, it's totally dependent on income. So you add the intercept is autonomous consumption, and you have uh, income multiplied by what's called the marginal propensity to consume, which turns out to be the only uh, variable that goes into determining the Keynesian spending multipliers, which you've heard a lot about, I'm sure. And then you, you stack on investment spending, which isn't dependent on income, importantly, and government spending, which also is not dependent on income. Notice the slope of the, that investment spending line and the government spending line is totally dependent on the, the consumption function. So you just sort of stack it on top. I, in my classes, I like to refer to it as a stack of pancakes. You've got a stack of consumption pancakes, a stack of investment spending pancakes, and a stack of terrible tasting government spending, <laughs> <laughs> government spending pancakes. <clears throat> okay, so the reason I talk about uh, the stack of pancakes is because it makes it easier for students to think about taking some of those pancakes out. So if we start taking away some spending, and in the Keynesian model, what's typically done is we say there's this unanticipated decrease in, in investment spending. So you see that investment spending line? What I'm about to do when I, when I click the button here is it's going to fall, but you'll notice that the top line falls down at the same rate. It does the, it does the same exact thing. So, and that's because what we're going to stipulate is that there is no response from the government. There's no government policy that steps in and says we're going to change the, we're going to change the way we're spending because of the change in investment spending. So, so watch what happens when we, when we have an unanticipated decrease in investment spending. Well, it wasn't very smooth. 
So they both fall together and the economy collapses. And the reason for that is because of a, a very important uh, Keynesian assumption that's, that's put in, and that is that wages are sticky. Everybody's heard of this, the whole sticky wage thing. And so since wages are sticky, if we have a decrease in spending, which means that firms are receiving lower revenue, uh, they, firms still have to pay those, those higher wages or those stuck wages. And so they, they decrease output, but then they can't lower the wage so that they can have full employment at the new lower level of spending and the new lower, lower level of output. So there's this inherent mismatch. There's these, inherent, persistent uh, uh, disequilibria in labor markets because wages are stuck at too high of a level for whatever reason. There are a few reasons that are offered, like uh, maybe uh, there's a psychological reason. Workers don't want to accept a lower wage. There are um, maybe uh, legal issues. So like what if the wage is at the minimum wage already, which means it's illegal to lower it. So whatever the case, if we have sticky wages, labor markets can't clear and so the economy just spirals down into depression. So like there's this initial decrease in investment spending that causes the whole economy to collapse. Which, by the way, in the Keynesian system would happen a lot because investment spending is considered as very unstable. It's guided by these animal spirits. It's impossible to predict. If, if investors are optimistic, then they'll uh, increase their spending. If they're pessimistic, then they'll decrease their spending. That's... That's basically, it just comes out of nowhere. There's just the major changes in investment spending that come from nowhere. And because of this inherent instability of investment spending, then the entire macro economy is, is in this fragile position. So the whole economy crashes. Okay, so let's look at the, how, the story of, the Keynesian story of how things can go right. So we had this, this unstable investment spending component. However, in this scenario here, we're stipulating that the government spending component completely makes up for any changes in the investment spending component. So the, there's a rule. So if there's a change in investment spending, then the government increases or decreases their spending to perfectly offset it. So you notice that the top line doesn't move in this case. So the animal spirits are moving that investment spending uh, line up and down. So investment spending increases and decreases all the time because of animal spirits. But the government, thankfully, is there to step in and prevent us from spiraling downward into depression because whenever the investment spending pancakes come out, the government adds some pancakes right on top so the total stack of the pancakes doesn't change. So, and that's what matters. We just want the stack of pancakes to, to stay the exact same size so that we don't have the spiral downward effect because of sticky wages. Oh, by the way, so we're in the judge's room. We're, I guess I should say the judge's jurisdiction. And so he allows questions. So uh, people have encountered these models in their classes. And so it's okay with me if you raise your hand. We can have a more informal uh, question and answer if you'd like. So if, any question, if you have any questions along the way, please, please raise your hand and ask. Okay, so this is the, the Keynesian story of things working right. Government saves the day is the moral of the story. So that was an early Keynesian model. The... Um, there was another model in, in between. So there was the ISLM model, and then after that came the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model. But the story didn't really change. So the, the, the policy prescriptions don't change. If we, have the, if we have any sort of unanticipated decrease in spending, this time we'll call it aggregate demand. So aggregate, the, the aggregate demand curve is that downward sloping um, curve here in this graph. If we have any decrease in aggregate demand, then we pull away from the long run level of output, the full, the full employment level of output. We slide down the short-run aggregate supply curve, which has its own really weird reasons for being slope, sloped upward, like sticky wages and misperceptions, other sticky prices. Uh, so there's some, some funny things going on in the, in the way that these um, uh, curves are sloped, but the, the moral of the story is the same. So the only hope is for some non-market entity to decide to increase spending to offset the original decrease. So um, I've seen this graph used to explain uh, the Great Depression. So there was this unexpe unexpected decrease in uh, investment spending, and then there was a subsequent decrease in consumption spending, and thank goodness FDR came in and increased government spending, and then we had a huge increase in government spending with World War II, and that's what allowed the aggregate demand curve to, to get us back to our long-run equilibrium. Question? Uh, yeah, so I've got that feeling in my neck now. I'm going to look out. What do you guys mean by sticking weight? Okay, so sticky wa the question is about sticky wages. What exactly are sticky wages? So sticky wages is this, this Keynesian idea that uh, 
wages can be st- stuck for for non-market or maybe even non-voluntary reasons. So we we know that wages are set by the laborers diminishing marginal uh uh revenue productivity. Sorry, I was searching for the word revenue productivity. Um however, if there is some sort of decrease in demand for labor based on the change in their in the in that worker's revenue productivity, then what the what a Keynesian economist might say is for some reason the equilibrium wage in that labor market won't come down for whatever reason and and it could be that the the workers just won't accept it they won't accept a lower wage or it could be that there are regulations or cultural reasons for this so there I've, I've seen a number of different reasons for it but the idea is that for some reason wages won't come down to the market clearing rate another question um, in my intermediate micro class or macro class um I guess you kind of said the same thing, but he argued that, Keynes argued, that eventually wages are going down and going down and going down. At some point, the workers say, no, I'm not taking a pay cut beyond that. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a there's this distinction between nominal wages and real wages. So the even even if the workers can achieve the same or even a higher real wage by accepting a lower nominal wage, the argument is that the nominal wages won't go down. They're not so they won't accept the the lower pay even if the goods and services that they can purchase with that lower nominal pay is the same or even higher. So it has to, it, a lot of the reasons have to do with the psychology of workers and the wages that they'll accept. Good point. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, good. So let's compare the Austrian story with the with the Keynesian story. So the the shape of the business cycle for Austrian economists is boom and then bust. So we have this we have a cause of the boom, and the cause is the artificial credit expansion. So it's boom and then bust. For the Keynesians, the the shape is bust and then boom. So there's this unexpected decrease in investment spending that sort of comes out of nowhere, and then the government steps in, saves the day, or there's some other exogenous increase in spending. Exogenous just means outside of the system. There's some sort of increase in in investment spending or government spending or consumption spending, perhaps, that allows aggregate demand to increase so that we get back to our long run equilibrium and, and we're out. So it's a bust and then boom. So so a lot of times when Austrians and, and Keynesians are debating each other, discussing business cycles with each other, just because the shape is different in the in the minds of these economists, they they start to talk past each other. So the if you consider the, the bust is the first part of the business cycle, then you, you're going to talk past or you're not going to be speaking the same language as somebody who considers the boom as the as the first phase of, of the cycle. The causes are totally different. The uh, uh, cause for Austrians is the artificial credit expansion. For Keynesians, it's the instability of investment spending, specifically an unexpected decrease in investment spending. And the diagnosis for for Austrians is the malinvestment and overconsumption that that Dr. Howden talked about in his in his lecture. So we we produce the wrong things in the wrong ways, and consumers increase their consumption beyond what they would have done absent the artificial credit expansion. For Keynesians, the diagnosis is there's there's this steep decrease in aggregate demand. The cure for Austrians is to simply let the bust run its course. Dr. Howden did a good job explaining how the recession is actually the healthy process of figuring out where the factors of production should be in the structure of production. So how should we be using all these capital goods and and labors that we have available? How should we be using all these resources in a productive and profitable way? And that's what the recession is. It's discovering, refiguring out how 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 to produce the things that consumers demand. The cure for the Keynesian is both expansionary monetary and expansionary fiscal policy. So I didn't talk through the details, but there are two ways to increase aggregate demand by policy. You can just increase government spending, which is a component of aggregate demand. And we saw that directly in the old Keynesian cross model. If we just increase government spending whenever there's a decrease in investment spending, then we avoid spiraling downward into depression. However, in the aggregate supply and aggregate demand model, it's uh, it's common for students to to list out what, what are the shifters of aggregate demand. And one of the shifters of aggregate demand is monetary policy. It turns out that if you increase the money supply through credit markets, you make it, you make it cheaper for uh, businesses to borrow to purchase factors of production. You also make it cheaper for consumers to borrow to purchase homes and cars. And so you can increase consumption spending and investment spending through expansionary monetary policy. Um, there's not, 
as much literature that I'm familiar with, but you can also, it seems like it's easier to increase government spending as well when you engage in expansionary monetary policy because the government can finance debts cheaper. There's less literature on that, though. So the moral of the story here is you can use expansionary monetary or fiscal policy to increase all sorts of spending uh, in the economy, and that's the cure. To restate the cure, Austrians would say we need to let consumer demand dictate how the factors of production are allocated, how resources are allocated. We want prices to be in accordance with what consumers demand, including the imputation of value from the consumer good back to the factors of production. So we want consumer demand to reign supreme. The cure for the Keynesians restated is the government needs to step in and be in charge of what prices are and what spending should be. This is a very critical point in, in my lecture. The prevention for Austrians is don't let, don't let there be an artificial credit expansion. Basically, leave money production out of the, the whims of bureaucrats. Don't, don't let money production belong to somebody who can just increase it or decrease it, especially if the increases come through credit markets. The prevention uh, for uh, Keynesians is the is um, let let the government have complete control in these sorts of cases. So if we need the government to have the ability to increase and decrease spending, increase and decrease the money supply, in the case we have this all of a sudden decrease in, in aggregate demand. All right, so the reason I said this is a critical point is because you'll notice that the, preve the prevention for the Austrians is the cure for the Keynesians. So the Keynesians say, we need to use expansionary monetary policy to fix the recessions. The Austrians say, no, that's what caused the problem in the first place. That's how you prevent future booms and busts. That's how you prevent the, the business cycle. So there's a very extreme divergence of views in terms of the, the, the view on expansionary monetary policy. Okay, I'm about to move on to monetarism. Any questions about the differences between Austrian school and, and Keynesians? Yes. Okay, pure like what would you say if somebody came and said, um, well, sure, there, there can be an Austrian boom, but then there could be a secondary depression explained by Keynesians, falling aggregate demand. Yeah, th um, there's a great paper by uh, Dr. Salerno uh, that explains the this, this secondary depression in, in the bo Austrian boom-bust cycle story. Uh, the, the paper is uh, Austrian business, a reformulation of Austrian business cycle theory. Am I getting that right? And so he, I recommend that you read that paper that explains that secondary depression. Yeah, it's a very good, very good paper. Any other questions? Okay, so monetarism is not very complicated, really. Uh, it's really just one equation. They sort of hang their hat on this, this quantity theory of money. So we can explain uh, almost all, maybe all macroeconomic phenomena just by looking at the quantity theory of money, also called the equation of exchange. Okay, so let's review the elements here. So we have the money supply is M. Skip over V for a second. P is the price level, which I talked about in my previous lecture. If you weren't there... There's no such thing as the price level. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Q is output. Sometimes it's T for the total volume of transactions or lowercase y for real output. I prefer just Q. This, this is how Roger Garrison taught me. And the, by golly, I'm going to follow Roger Garrison. So M, MV equals PQ. All right, so the reason I saved V for last is because it's actually defined by the other elements in this in this uh, equation. So V is, is called the velocity of money or the velocity of circulation of the money supply, the turnover rate of the money supply, or how many times the average dollar is spent in the economy, which you get by taking the total level of expenditure, which is the prices times the quantity, P times Q, and you divide it by the money supply. So V is literally... It's, it's, like when, it's like super endogenous. It's defined by the other variables in the system. And Rothbard in uh, Man, Economy, and State has a very good section uh, talking about how absurd it is to have a variable in this equation that's, that's only there because you need it to make the two sides equal each other. And the reason this is important is because <clears throat> there's no such thing as the velocity of money in, in purely logically derived economic theory. So the velocity of money doesn't enter into anybody's choice 
There's no, like when I'm going out to the grocery store to purchase, you know, the elements to make a burrito, perhaps, I'm not considering, you know, what is the velocity of money today? Or I'm also not considering what is the general level of prices. I'm making my own individual choices based on my value of the of ca the cash that I have, my cash balance, and also the goods that I would use to 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 construct the burrito. Okay, so the velocity of money is a, is a is a strange uh, figure here, but and it's defined as total level of exp of expenditure p times q divided by um, m the money supply. So if you have a hundred dollars in a very small economy, a hundred dollars worth of spending, and only twenty dollars exist in this economy, so the true money supply. The money supply for this economy is $20. It would take spending that $20 on average five times to achieve the total level of spending. So that's a, a good way to think about what the velocity of money is. Okay, so how do we use or how do we think about this equation? So they, it depends on who's writing, which monetarist you're reading. Um, Friedman, the, probably the father of monetarism, uh, assumed that the velocity of money is relatively constant, doesn't change much from year to year. And over the time span that he was looking at it, there's been some debate over whether or not he fudged the numbers or that he smoothed it out too much. Um, but in his, his book, A Monetary History of the United States, he, over the time period that he was looking at, yeah, it was relatively stable. Now, outside that time period, it's been shown that there have been some pretty big changes in the velocity of money. But for Friedman's uh, use of this equation. He assumed that velocity stays constant. And as a policy goal, we're going to try to stabilize prices. So the policy goal of, of Keynesians was to maximize employment. And we want to maintain that full employment level of income. The policy goal for monetarists is to keep prices stable. And the idea here is that if we keep prices stable, that makes it easier for consumers and businesses to make decisions about the present and the future. So we... so. If, and if they can more confidently, with less uncertainty, make those decisions because of a stable price level, prices aren't changing too much, then we'll have consistent economic growth, which would look like this. So we'll have you know, steady increases in Q, steady increases in output, which means for, the, for this equation to balance out, you have to have the same increases in M at the same time. So simultaneous or, or um, yeah, balanced increases in output with increases in the money supply. So here you can see immediately there's going to be a big disagreement between monetarists and Austrians about that, about increasing the money supply, specifically because Austrians will say, if you increase the money supply, then you're going to start the boom-bust cycle. Okay, so this is one way of looking at the, at the elements of, of the equation of exchange. Uh, the way I've seen some monetarists describe the, the Great Depression is that there, the Fed allowed this big decrease in the money supply. So they allowed all the bank failures, which caused the money supply to collapse. So the money supply decreased, and there was this big decrease in output. And actually, it was so big, and because of the, the, price, the price level, excuse me, the money supply was falling, prices also fell, and the velocity fell. So we had this this decreases all around. So the, the Great Depression was just money supply was falling, velocity of money was falling as people, they're more reluctant to, to spend money, so the velocity of money decreases. Prices also fall, and output obviously fell by about a third. So this is the monetarist, this is really the, the main apparatus that monetarists use to analyze uh, macroeconomic phenomena. Okay, so this is not cherry picking. So this is a direct quote from uh, the book by Friedman and Schwartz. So here uh, they say, changes in the behavior of the money stock have been closely associated with changes in economic activity, money income, and prices. The interrelation between monetary and economic change has been highly stable. Monetary changes have often had an independent origin. So uh, if, if we have a central bank that has discretion over the money supply, that's that's what they're talking about, that independent origin. They have uh, not been simply a reflection of changes in economic activity. So, so we can use M as a policy variable. So that's outside of the market system. Use M as a policy variable to achieve the macroeconomic ends that we would like, namely stable price levels so that we can have consistent economic growth. Okay, so what are the Austrian responses to this? There are quite a few. 
probably the most fundamental response is that the analysis starts with data availability as opposed to sound economic theory. So they're not starting from the ground up. How do people make choices? Why do people purchase this as opposed to this? Or, or talking, talking about things from a, from a micro found out foundation, as some economists might say. It starts with, well, we've got this money supply data. We can construct data on the velocity of money by taking total expenditures and dividing it by the money supply. And we know it's true, so it has to be true that the money supply times the number of times it's spent, it must be equal to, to total expenditure, price times quantity. So we, we have this data, so let's use this as our main apparatus of, of considering changes in the macroeconomy. As opposed to the, the Austrian method, which was we start with human action, you get diminishing margin utility, you get law of demand, law of supply, and onwards and upwards until you construct this massive um, business cycle theory or critique of socialism, for example. Another uh, criticism is that, um, well, this really isn't a criticism. It's just a statement. MV equals PQ is a tautology. There's really no argument over the truthfulness of this. So even if you consider uh, P an array of prices or a vector of prices, you can still multiply it by the vector the horizontal vector of all of the different goods that are produced in the economy. So you can still calculate total spending on the right-hand side, and that must equal, there's no argument over this, the, the money supply times the, the velocity, if the velocity is defined as whatever number it takes to get these two sides to equal each other. So there's no argument over the, the truthfulness of this equation. The argument is over the, the cause and effect. And just if you just look at an equation, the cause and effect isn't clear. In fact, if you notice the two examples that I went through, one time, I started with an increase in output and said, well, the, the, what that implies is that we need to have a, a monetary policy like this. And in the other example, I said, well, suppose we allow the money supply to, to collapse. What's going to happen to the other variables in the system? So, so there's this big question over what, which variable causes what? Which, which one is endogenous? Which one is exogenous? What, what direction is, is the cause and effect here? And it's not clear just from the equation where that is, as opposed to the Austrian um, apparatus, so the Austrian theory where cause and effect is at every step along the way. Here's a nice quote from Mises. He says, it's essentially nothing, he's talking about the equation of exchange, it's ex essentially nothing but a mathematical expression of the untenable doctrine that there is proportionality in the movements of the quantity of money and of prices. So this is um, not just an, a critique of the equation of exchange, but also of thinking about changes in the money supply having a proportionate or even effect on the, the general level of prices. So, so Mises d did a total smackdown of, of this, of, of thinking about that relationship as a mechanical one. So if we increase the money supply, there's going to be this sort of effect in general on the price level. And thinking about all prices changing in one direction versus another direction, Mises just totally smashed it. So it turns out that there's no way to do that. Even in the Angel Gabriel model, there's no way to say for sure that all prices are going to rise evenly or decrease evenly if there's some sort of change in the, in the money supply. Austrians would also say there's no such thing as the price level. So as a, as a number, so we can't just plug in one number in this in this equation. There's no such thing as the price level. Uh, it's the closest thing that we can get to is a constellation of prices. Uh, one of my favorite analogies is the swarm of bees uh, analogy. That the price the price level is like a swarm of bees. So all of these prices that are moving in relation to each other, the swarm can go up and the swarm can go down. But if you're just looking at the midpoint of the swarm of bees, then you're sort of missing the whole point. You're missing the, all of the relative changes, all of the Cantillon effects that might happen. Another criticism is that there's, there's no reason to seek to stabilize P. In fact, Austrians would say like the whole point of prices is for them to be able to move up and down in accordance with the, the total stock of some good and the demand for that good. So we want prices to fluctuate. We also want prices in general to be able to fluctuate in accordance with people's change in the demand for money. So like we need prices and the entire price level to be able to fluctuate. So there's so seeking to stabilize the price level is it seems first of all, it seems sort of arbitrary. Like why? Why seek to stabilize something that we need? In the functioning of a market economy, we need prices to be able to change. Uh, we've already talked about how V is pretty much meaningless. 
Uh, there's a, another quote from Mises here. The, the mathematical economists refuse to start from the various individuals' demand for and supply of money. They introduce instead the spurious notion of velocity of circulation fashioned according to the patterns of mechanics. Mises also criticized the, the, the idea of money circulating, period. So money actually doesn't circulate. At any given moment, all dollars are held by somebody. They're in somebody's cash balance. So even in a transaction, at one moment the, the money belongs to one person and the next moment it belongs to the other person. So this, it's not really good to think about money circulating through the economy, even though I, I tend to use this phrase as well. But if you're, if you're thinking about the circulation of money, either from a Keynesian or a monetarist perspective, then you're sort of missing out on the fact that money is demanded to be held in individual cash balances by individuals, as opposed to thinking about money as this independent abstract variable that's that's flowing through the economy either in a circle or it's it's being turned over like in the the quantity theory of money um, once again similar to the Keynesian critique that we saw from the Austrians the policy prescription in a recession which is expansionary monetary policy restarts the boom bust cycle so Friedman was uh, very famous for saying that the Fed should have stepped in during the Great Depression or during the initial crash in the money supply. They should have stepped in and prevented that decrease in the money supply by bailing out banks, by increasing the money supply in, in various means. So this is what causes the boom-bust cycle for Austrians once again. So this is a, a good analogy uh, of the problems of monetarism from Roger Garrison. This uh, story, the, the case of the cabbage-eating Mississippi monster. So we'll, we'll work through this and see what Garrison has to say. Suppose that in late October of 1929, a thousand-pound monster showed up in Mississippi. It spent the next three and a half years eating all the cabbages and quite a few rabbits between Jackson and Pascagoula. By early March of 1933, the monster weighed 4,000 pounds. It's a big monster. Two investigators are sent to Mississippi to get a handle on the situation. One is from Vienna, the other is from Chicago. The, Vienna, the Viennese investigator asks, where in the world did this hideous thing come from? So the analogy here is that Austrians are, they see a business cycle and they look for what, is, what caused it, what caused the boom that preceded this bust. And they're gonna look for expansionary monetary policy. They're gonna look for new money entering the, the economy through the, the credit markets. And so Garrison says, here I seem to have stacked the cards against the Austrian. It's, it's hard to even imagine an insightful answer to this question, unless, of course, the monster turns out to be the unintended consequence of some ill-conceived government-sponsored bionics project. <laughs> so I, I wonder if uh, Stranger Things could approach Roger Garrison for some ideas on Stranger Things Season 4. This, this would be a great story there. The Chicagoan shows up shoves the Austrian aside and says, never mind how this thing got here. The real question is, how did it grow from 1,000 pounds to 4,000 pounds? How did an ordinary run-of-the-mill garden variety recession, excuse me, monster, quadruple its weight in 40 months? So how do, how do these small recessions turn into big recessions? The Chicagoans' answer, of course, is it was all the cabbages. It's the cabbages' fault that the, the, the monster was eating. He couldn't get good data on the rabbits, unfortunately. The correlation between cabbage consumption and weight gain leaves no doubt about the issue. So this is, an, this is a fun story to show how monetarists look at recessions and business cycles compared to how Austrians look at business cycles. So Austrians show up, ask, what caused? Where did the monster come from? Where did the, the bust come from? And they're going to look at the boom. Chicagoans, when they're looking at changes in the variables after the fact, when they're looking at you know changes in the money supply, changes in price, changes in output, once there is a bust, then they're, they can talk about all, they can talk about this all they want to, but they're still not asking the right question, which is where did the bust come from in the first place? Uh, just as an aside, if you're interested in researching uh, sort of the shape of Friedman's uh, b business cycle model, you should uh, Google the plucking model, P-L-U-C-K, plucking model. It's so, like there's this long run growth trend and you can pluck down this line and you get the bust and then the boom. So the shape for the business cycle for monetarists is the same as the Keynesians. It's bust and then boom. So, so Keynesians and monetarists are in the same camp in, in terms of uh, shape, as well as uh, other things, which we'll get to in, in one second. Milton Friedman died uh, before the financial crisis, but he lived long enough to have the opportunity to see what was happening while the housing bubble was being inflated. And so uh, Professor Salerno found this quote, and I, I thank him for it. Uh, Friedman was interviewed by Charlie Rose, December 
of 2005 when it was it was becoming very obvious that there was a housing bubble. And actually, even in 2002 and 2004, you can find some of the early uh, the earliest Austrian predictions of the housing bubble and, and the consequences uh, that came. So here's what Friedman said. The United States is at the peak of its performance in its history. There's never been a time in the United States when we have had the state of prosperity, its level and its spread that we've had in the last 10 or 15 years. There's never been a 15 year period in which there has been so little fluctuation in prices and inflation. Inflation has stayed around two or 3% or less for the last 15 years. It's unprecedented. I certainly do, and then it's implied in the interview, give credit to Alan Greenspan for that. I think monetary policy is primarily responsible for it. So so Friedman totally missed. I know it's, it seems unfair because he's dead now, but <laughs> I mean, if, if, if we can show monetarists didn't predict this, not just Friedman, but other monitors didn't predict this, but Austrians did, it seems like we should, you know, take a good look at the perspective in which they were predicting what, what happened. Okay, so I said at the, at the very end we would talk about the similarities between monetarism and Keynesianism, and here they are. So both start their analysis with data availability. What sort of macroeconomic aggregates do we have available? What can we tally up? What can we count? As opposed to the Austrian position, which is, let's make an entire edifice of necessarily true, apodictically certain economic theory, and then see what we can say about the economy, as opposed to what the monetarists and Keynesians do, which is, what data do we have, and what can, what can we do with that data? The MV equals PQ equation, I don't know if anybody picked up on this, is actually the same thing as the Y is equal to E equation. They're both tallying up total expenditures for the economy just in different ways. So the Keynesians, they'll disaggregate expenditure between consumption spending, investment spending, government spending, and net exports. The monetarists will disaggregate it. It's, it's actually, there's less uh, disaggregation, there's more aggregation on the monetarist side than there is on the, on the Keynesian side. So at least for Keynesians, they disaggregate Q into the different types of products that, that people are, consume, are consuming and using consumption and investment in government. But we just have Q. We just have total real output there for the, for the uh, monitor. So there's a higher level of aggregation even on the monitor side. The policy prescription is the same. So Keynesians would say, yeah, we can use expansionary monetary policy to get us out of a depression, to solve the bust. So we have the bust and then the boom. Keynesians would add, yeah, we can also use fiscal policy. Monetarists are generally distrustful of, of using fiscal policy and using that part of government to fix the problem, but they're A-OK -okay with using monetary policy just like the Keynesians are. So there's total, total alignment in terms of the policy prescription from both monetarists and Keynesians. And here I have a couple of quotes. Here's one from Friedman. We all use the Keynesian language and apparatus. And he just says that he rejects the Keynesian conclusions. Well, I would argue that I don't know about that. His conclusions seem pretty similar. Uh, a quote from Krugman uh, that I got from um, a Robert Murphy blog post. Um, <clears throat> you can always count on Murphy to find those good Krugman quotes. So Krugman said, old style Friedman type monetarists who focus on monetary aggregates are essentially in the same camp as Keynesians. So why don't they just, you know, hug and kiss and, and just make it clear to everybody in the world. So thank you very much.